Hello, my friends, and welcome. Welcome to Theophania's Foundations of the Craft series. And we are on module four, the praxis section. So we just have finished the theory section dealing with the theoi and other spirits. And now we're going to begin talking about the praxis of relating to the theoi and other spirits. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So as I said, we're going to be talking about the relationships with the theoi and the other spirits as far as the practice of it. So when you are dealing with any of the beings that do not naturally normally live in bodies the way in which we do, just like you're dealing with another human being, you are dealing with relationships. So if you are going to be doing something in which you are calling upon one of the great ones, my first piece of advice is don't cold call if you have the ability to do some research first. So I gave some information in the last video about the warning about only looking at myths. You really want to look more deeply than just the myths, looking again at their epithets, at their rights, and trying to do some understanding about what the great ones that you're about to call on cares about or the spirit. Um, you know, if you can do, it's easier to do research obviously on gods that have a kind of uh, historical cultural framework built around them than it is to just calling on a particular spirit. But for a lot of the ancestors, you can also do some research. So try to find out as much as you can about what it is that the spirit that you are about to call on, what do they care about or the being with whom you are building a relationship. Once you have established contact, once you are able to connect to whatever beings these are that you are attempting to build relationships with, ask them what they like, ask them how you should communicate with them, ask them how they want to interact with you, set up some parameters so that you know if they're reaching out to you, set up some of those kinds of um, communication protocols so that you can fall back on them. Another quick piece of advice when you are building relationships with the theoi, be respectful. Obviously you want to be respectful, but don't be terrified of them either. So, you know, if you make a mistake with one of them, apologize, but my personal recommendation to you is also don't put up with beings who won't be understanding of our limitations or are overly imperious. Should you run into any of those, there are sometimes beings that their dominant interactions with humans have been in very different kinds of formats and that um, can be pretty heavy handed. And my advice to you is there's no need to put up with that. There are plenty, plenty of beings who are wonderful to be in relationship with and there's no need to put up with beings that are either, um, like I said, overly imperious or are not, as forgiving with us as we would be with each other. <laughs> I've always said any God that is less tolerant, less forgiving and less kind than I am in all of my limitations as I strive to become better is not a God that I intend to be in close relationship with and certainly not one that I intend to be in a devotional relationship with. So. All of that is coming from my filters to you, but I encourage you to kind of give some thought about those sorts of parameters in your own mind. The other thing that you'll want to find out when you're in the process of learning about various theoi, various gods, various spirits with whom you might want to be in a relationship is that you, if you are calling on multiple beings simultaneously, like in a particular ritual, you'll wanna find out if there's any reason you shouldn't do that. So for example, if you are working with um, some of the beings from some of the 
African diaspora traditions, there's some that you just never, they don't get along uh, with each other. And so, you know, you always want to figure that out. And certainly before you go mixing up pantheons, you want to have some sort of an understanding about do they get along? Now, my experience with a lot of the great ones is, you know, the pantheon issue, many of them know each other perfectly well and work quite well together. So it's not like, in my opinion, you have to be strict. Like I, I can never work with someone outside of the Hellenic pantheon. I mean, I absolutely don't think that. And in fact, the ancient Greeks did that all the time. But I do think you wanna find out if there's any reason why there's conflict. So the other thing with relationships is again, to, to remember that these are mutual relationships. There should be reciprocity involved. And you know, if you repeatedly call on one of the great ones and they don't seem to be interested in having a relationship with you, then that may also be a sign. So it needs to be from both sides and obviously there should be no coercion there. I mean, good luck coercing the gods or not good luck, but regardless, you know what I'm saying, but you know, you also should not feel coerced. Okay. So Communication is really the medium of all relationships. So I think that you can actually look at an awful lot of religion as methods of communicating with beings that are not standing right beside us that we can talk to like we would a being who is in a body. And communication really has these two different forms. There's the speaking aspect and then there's the listening aspect. And so to build a strong relationship with one of the great ones, you're going to have to build those two pieces, how to speak, how to listen. So there's lots of different ways of speaking. And some of the most traditional is obviously there's prayers. Prayers are important. Prayers are good. Prayers are, are one of the most important ways that we, we speak to the great ones, to the theoi, to these, these other beings. There's also, of course, hymns. So hymns, in the traditional sense, you know, they're musical, obviously, but they also often have to do with praise, and they are often devoted to one of the beings. They sometimes tell a big chunk of their story. So like, for instance, the Homeric hymn to Demeter, which is one of the most famous of the Homeric hymns. These are very ancient hymns, and they tell very critically important stories about this goddess. Also, and we talked a bit about this in the last one, making offerings, which are really just kind of, um, they're gifts. Votive offerings are frequently offerings given specifically in gratitude and thanks for something. So if you were to go to a temple of Asclepius, you will often find votive offerings that are um, replicas of the piece of the body that the, the God healed. Uh, if you are in Delphi, and I always recommend that people go to Delphi. <laughs> um, but if you're in Delphi, there were all sorts of these treasure houses that were filled with offerings of thanks to Apollon for the guidance that he had given through his oracle that had then led to victory or to a successful trading adventure or to the successful founding of a colony or any number of things. So an offering is just something that you give as part of an expression, a way of talking with one of the gods on a more regular basis. And then a votive offering is something that is specifically in thanks. So there's also in the old traditional ways, there's adati and agon. So this would be more directly out of the ancient Greek tradition. Um, adati is uh, the pursuit of excellence. So uh, and agon is the contest. So it's where we get agony, but it really has to do with the competition, the contest. So these are things like the building and developing of some form of excellence and then these competitions that they would have in order to share this excellence. And they would do this in devotion of one of the great ones. So for instance, the Olympics. But there's also, for example, the Pythian Games. So the Pythian Games, which are at Delphi and they're in honor of a bullum, they not only include the competitions that are the uh, athletic competitions, they also include all sorts of artistic competitions. 
And you'll see you know, both those in many, many different places. But I think from our perspective, since we are not going to be refounding the Pythian Games anytime in the near future, in all likelihood, the big thing here is that you can develop some form of excellence, some form of virtue, and that effort can be devoted, can be a sign of devotion to one of the great ones, should you decide to um, basically make it an offering, to, to make it an offering, to do it in their honor. Any of the form of the arts, you can always honor the great ones through your creativity. And again, you just, uh, you say that you were doing something and you were making this dedication in honor of one of the great ones. And that can be for the arts, like the creation of a statue, a painting, a piece of knitting. Here's more mine. So <laughs> um, it can also be in any of the performing arts. You know, you dedicate a concert, you dedicate your attempt to learn how to play the violin or whatever. You can do any of these things if you're doing it with kind of the sense that in doing this, you are trying to um, honor one of the great ones who would care about whatever that is, then that can help build that relationship. Often, um, you know, there were festivals, various kinds of big celebrations that were uh, society wide. And as we are doing this now, again, you can take some of your holidays and focus on some of the great ones and celebrate in their honor. And really kind of any acts in honor of one of the great ones, if you do it with intention. And this is an important thing with any of these things, when you are attempting to use them as a method of speaking to one of the gods, you must tell them that it is in their honor. <laughs> you must make that absolutely out loud explicit that you are doing this in their honor. So one of my examples that I use is that I pick up a lot of trash and throw it away. And I do so in honor of Poseidon because in me keeping that plastic out of the oceans, that's something he cares about. And I can take that little bit of merit and activity and attention. And as I'm putting it into the trash can, I say, hail Poseidon. And that is, you know, uh, an act of honoring him. And in my mind, and because I am oriented this way and because I am regularly dedicating this action and the attention that I am feeding to this great one, it actually has really helped me build a much stronger relationship with him and gets his attention faster. So those are some of the ways of speaking. But like I said, you have to let them know that what you were doing is an honor of them. It can't just be in your mind. So, in terms of the, the praying or in terms of really calling to them and asking them to be present, this the way in which you do that typically is through an invocation. And there are a number of different pieces that go into a traditional invocation. And those include calling, you're gonna name the great one, but often also calling on specific epithets that are relevant to the reason for why you are calling them. So for example, Apollo Maliatas, Yatros, Yatros, great physician, healer of bodies, of souls, of societies, I call you. So that is very specifically, it's calling Apollo, but it's calling a very specific aspect of him. Sometimes you would be naming yourself and claiming your relationship or why they should pay attention. And often that is a saying, you know, um, you who I have loved since I was a child, you who I have loved and been in relationship with for many generations, for many incarnations, you know, uh, that kind of a thing. So it's establishing that, that piece. Also uh, expressions of understanding about what they care about. If what you're calling them for is something that you are going to ask for their assistance in something, 
then tie it to why they should care, tie it to their own agenda. Also a traditional invocation will often use praise and give gratitude and thanks for what they have given us. So it can also be a request. Um, you know, you can also just invoke them in order to have them hear your praise and gratitude, or it can be a request for intercession. It can be um, aid and work that is in alignment with their agenda. And again, there's this expression of reciprocity. So that is, you know, this, this gratitude, this attention, this kind of gift back to them. So, you know, I will often pour a glass of wine or something for a libation, but it's not necessary. It's not, it's, like I said, it's not tit for tat, but giving them something that they like you know, as, as part of what you would do with a friend, as part of what you would do with a guest, as part of what you would do in just building good relations. So, um, you know, again, as part of that mutuality where you are giving as well as taking. But part of what you also wanna be doing, I'm calling this the calling card here, you know, especially if it is not a being with whom you are in very deeply intimate relationship already. Once you're in that really deeply intimate relationship, you don't have to do quite as much to get their attention. <laughs> but uh, in addition to an invocation, if it's not a being that you know as well and that you can easily and quickly reach, you may need to do other things to help them realize that you're actually calling for them. Again, you know, we use their names, but it is my belief that Poseidon is not the name that he has for himself. That is not the name that, you know, he automatically naturally comes to. And he may have other names and other pantheons for all I know. He may be, um, I believe he is probably bigger than just this planetary system. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, when we're, we're calling to one of these great beings, you need to try to make sure that they think, oh, you know, you got to get on their radar. And then it's also like, oh no, this is really, this is really a call for me. So there's lots of different ways to do that. There's statues or art in whatever that form is that you use. Like I said, the epithets are really helpful, but then there's also often associations. So you can have like, there's colors or numbers, incense, herbs, flowers, symbols, any of these things that would say in the aggregate as you're sending that beacon up, trying to get attention like, oh, this is really, this is a call for me. Also traditional hymns, if you have them, and, and we have some parts of a sacred story. You can read, you can tell, you can put and work into your invocation. And then any of the pieces of ancient cultic practice that would kind of fire that beacon up a little bit that would make sense for you. It needs to make sense for you, but also might help at least in resonance to kind of ring that a bit if that makes sense. So again, whenever you're doing anything to honor one of the great ones or are trying to talk with them, you need to invoke them. You need to call to them in some way. It does not always have to be the really big uh, formal invocation with all of the stuff, especially once you have that kind of closer relationship where they have got a good read on your energy signal and are going to be more likely to quickly recognize if it is you and that you are calling them. But when you're doing something, you need to be making it explicit that it is for them. Because one of the things to note is that they don't live in time and space the same way that we do. And so again, you need to get their attention. If it is a daily practice piece, that can definitely be less elaborate, but it does need to get their attention in some way. So I have, as do oh so many pagan statues and various things of that nature. And I dedicate particular candles that I have going and I call to them. And, you know, that's all part of daily practice. And then if it is a being that I do not know so well, 
then I go and do a lot of research and try to gather up enough things that when I do make that call, they are more likely to recognize that I am calling to them given that I may not be a known number <laughs> if you think about it like getting a phone call. So, all right. So your first assignment, and I really hope that you're all doing these assignments because this will only get you so far if you don't actually do the work. There's an awful lot of information in all of these, but you need to do the work. So I'm gonna say choose either a great one that you work with or that you would like to get to know better. And probably one that you would like to get to know better. Because if you know one really intimately, then you kind of already know this stuff. But for one that you don't know as well, do some background research. And again, don't just stick with the myths, go deeper than that. And then write an invocation asking whoever that great one is to come because that's really what an invocation is. It's a call in which you are sending an invitation. And then plan some of the other parts that you would use to get the great one's attention. So, you know, would you use particular colors? Would you use particular numbers or musical instruments or pieces of a hymn or telling a story? Like what are some of the other pieces there that you might use, particular uh, herbs around or flowers, any of that kind of stuff that would make them say, ah, ah, that's me. Like for a polon, bay leaves. Bay leaves are really big. <laughs> so, you know, things like that, that would make you go, ah, okay, I am being called upon. And so create that, and we're gonna get back to using it here at the end of this next one. So we've talked a little bit now about speaking. The next part of that is listening, and there's a number of different ways that you can listen for the great ones. First and foremost are omens. Look for omens. Start getting in the habit of assuming that the world is talking to you <laughs> and start paying attention to omens. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Now, I mean, if you're someone who is prone to extreme anxiety, then, you know, be a little careful because you don't want to start seeing like anxious things all the time because um, that's not really what you're after. But just like ask the great ones, like, please give me signs. And then you got to pay attention to those signs when they arise. And there's some really old ones of doing some of that too. Like um, there's saying a prayer and then saying, all right, the next thing that I randomly hear in language is going to provide a key for me. Set that up as an expectation and then walk outside and see what the first thing that you hear is. And that's a very, very old form of divination, actually, or of omen seeking. And then divination itself, you know, be that tarot cards or runes or oem or any of the, you know, dice throwing, there's any number of different things here. These are basically provoked omens. This is where you're saying, okay, all right, speak to me. <laughs> and then, you know, you're doing something that uh, you're kind of causing an omen to appear. There's also dreams and what I call trans theophanies, which are basically these situations in which you are encountering the gods, but you are not um, in a normal waking state of consciousness. And I would include a lot of shamanic journeying in this realm, which, you know, for many of us who do that kind of other world journey work, in which we are seeking and communi communing with spirits and the gods. This is where I would put that because you are seeing them, but you're not seeing them like physically here. And sometimes that altered state of consciousness, especially if it's a dream situation can be a little harder sometimes to parse exactly what's going on. But that's an important one is to pay attention to your dreams. There's also oracles. So oracles are, um, when one of the great ones consciously speaks and acts through a human being. And that can be through like mediumship, 
in which they are possessing someone and using their body to speak through them. It can also be kind of that channeling situation in which you're listening and then speaking out what it is that you're hearing. And then there's the mediator that uh, goes kind of back and forth relatively fluidly between kind of now I am just allowing the, uh, the great one to come directly through me. And now I am listening and observing and able to speak and, and talk back. Um, and there's a lot more that could be said about this category, but that is another, another way of listening. There's also very rarely full theophanies, which is where one of the great ones appears like right here in the physical world and you see them right there like you're looking at them. That's, that's rare, but has been known to happen. And then what I would say for most people, and it almost can be a form of channeling to a certain extent, is communion, which is where you are sitting quietly in a devotional space and you're just listening and paying attention to however it is that your thoughts or um, your vision are being moved when you are directly praying and then trying to listen to one of the great ones. And for some of us that comes in language and for others it may come in a different form, but that kind of idea of being in close communion, I think is, um, kind of the, the central thing to devotional practice, honestly, which among other things means you got to get quiet enough for that to happen. So some of the challenges then in this is that the Theoi and other spirits that are different than us and ancestors, of course, as we had discussed before, are the closest to us. They're just quite different sometimes than we are. And that includes that they don't experience space-time the same way. They um, have very different perspectives depending on something that I call, and it's on down the list a little bit, the human user interface. It can be difficult for some of them. Um, some of them have that better than others. And if you're really dealing with a non-human entity that does not have a long history of dealing with humans, and there are a bunch of classes of spirits that are like this, then you know, take your most difficult cross-cultural communication situation and amp it up a hundred times. So that can be a challenge. It can also be a really exciting, beautiful, enriching experience. The other thing is that the, the gods in particular and some of the other beings, they're not perceiving our consciousness stream the same way we do. In other words, we tend to be consciously aware of like this much at any given point in time is the part that's usually going on immediately in that middle self. And that, you know, that part for me that I am speaking through right now, but our consciousness is running on a huge, huge continuum all the time. And we have just filtered most of that out. We're not aware of it. So when we are dealing with one of the great ones, they're perceiving the whole gamut typically. And so there's a number of different things that they often will do. First of all, there can be some miscommunication there because you can be saying one thing and the vast majority of the part of you that does not have um, control over the talking self is sending an entirely different message. This is a really common thing. So, you know, that can be a challenge that, you know, we have to, we have to work through. And then a lot of the, the beings have, um, you know, some of them have those better, what I, what I call the human user interface than others. Like one of the things that's really, really wonderful about the Hellenic, the Greek great ones is they've got really good human user interface. It's really good. And that's very, very helpful. But I'm going to give you one hint here. If you're ever dealing with a pantheon that maybe does not have as good human user interface in general, you know, it could be that they have not been in close relationship with humans for a very, very long time. And that uh, culture was constructed so differently at the point in which they were in communication with us that it's 
you feel like you're doing this a lot, figure out um, who are the healing deities in that pantheon. Because the healing deities, in order to be good at healing, have to have a really good understanding of humans. <laughs> so, and I guess the other part of that is, you know, there are plenty of the, the great ones that human beings are kind of at best secondary to their area of, um, you know, their area of influence. And so they just haven't spent as much time with humans and that's fine. But if you need a translator in a particular pantheon, I would take a look and see if you can build a relationship with whoever the healing deity is, if that's an issue. The other thing that is a challenge is that whenever you are dealing with any of the spirits, you know, if you're in direct communion or anything with any of the spirits, it's all running through our personal psychology. So, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that can come through, but it's going to end up filtered through whatever our psychology is. And so there will be um, potential for accretion and distortion. And in fact, there's almost always some of that. So that's just something to be aware of. Now, I'm, I'm going to point out that, you know, when we're having a conversation, including right now, whatever I'm saying is hitting your personal psychology and you are filtering through that. So, you know, we always have these kinds of filters up, but when you're dealing with a being that is working entirely through your communication structure and using your language and using, you know, all of your bodies to communicate with you, there is a higher risk of some distortion there. The other thing that I have found is that they'll often drop content into parts of us that um, are not the middle self, and then it has to work its way out. You know, some of us call this like getting a download, and it's like getting a zip file into some part of yourself, and then there's often like a challenge as you have to um, allow it to unzip. <laughs> and get everything out. So part of the reason that I'm saying this is that it's a very good idea, especially if you're in a big ritual and you find yourself very moved and you have no idea why, go back and walk through that ritual in your imagination, in your mind later. Because chances are that what was happening was not in the part of self that is the talking self that you are consciously aware of in that moment. I've had massive stuff that has come through when I've gone back and done that and it's experiencing the, the ritual in an entirely different way. And I try to go back whenever I have any kind of like big experiences and go through multiple times because there's often a lot of stuff that's in there that just has not yet fully made it into, you know, my brain here. <laughs> okay. So some of the things that really help with this, regular practice of any of these systems, regular practice of listening, regular practice of meditation or various kinds of psychological discovery, because the more aware that you are of what is you versus not you, the more you're going to be able to say, oh, I'm in communion with another being right now that is successfully working. And it will also help you to go, mm, I got this thing. And uh, I thought it was whoever, but now that I'm looking at it a little bit more closely and paying more attention, I think that might've been just me. So it'll just help whenever you get more clarity there. And like I said, it's all running through you. So it's all going to be colored by you. And that's not a bad thing, but you just want to be kind of, more aware of what is you so that you know what's not. Omens, pay attention. And, you know, I'm going to say this with anything actually that you do with the great ones, write it down, but especially with omens, write them down. Because a lot of times you'll start second guessing yourself. And maybe I'm projecting that onto you, but I think that's pretty normal. I think we do a lot of second guessing ourselves. And so it can be really helpful to have a written record that you go back to and it's there, you can see it and you're not doing revisionist history. 
because at least for myself, I often will kind of start wondering a little bit later, did that really happen? Am I just making this up? Am I just, and you know, again, we have all the socialization that is in our way. Our socialization is very unhelpful in this regard. And to me, having a written record really helps me go, oh no, no, there it is, there it is. I saw this and I took this as this kind of a sign and now I can verify that it's there and that helps build my confidence. And if you're building a relationship, you know, intentionally build up the signs of how you can work with them. So again, in the very first Praxis video, we talked about using a pendulum as a way to connect with the parts of yourself that are not the talking parts. And so you can use that pendulum and you can be like, all right, being X, are you here? And see if it says yes or no. And just begin asking questions and talking that way. And that way, um, you know, through the pendulum, through like yes or no answers. And that helps kind of build that, um, the connections so that at some point you will not need as much external support. And you can also ask things like, are we communicating well? Would you like to try X and various things like that um, to help you get better in terms of your communication with that particular being? So as far as like the communion, like I said, communing with other beings to me, this is the heart of a devotional practice. And how easy this is for you is gonna depend on a number of factors, including what we're just calling the hardware software of the individual, like how there's a, a certain ease that this has for some people and it's very difficult for others. Like for example, like I have real difficulty with spatial reasoning. I just do. It doesn't mean I can't do it. It means it's hard and it takes a lot of effort and a lot of practice and a lot of trying to come at it from different angles. This part, the communication with beings that are not in bodies, that's really easy for me. It just is. That's the first kind of clear gift that I ever had that showed up and made itself apparent. And that is easy for me. So, you know, sacred geometry, real struggle. This one I can do. Other people have, you know, a different mix, but I believe anyone can do this. It's just, it may be more difficult and take a lot more practice. But another thing that is often in the way with um, communing is that you really need to feel safe in order to do this because you're opening yourself up to another being. I mean, just like you need to feel safe, you need to be allowed, any relationship takes a certain amount of vulnerability and how much vulnerability you are willing to give in a particular circumstance has a whole lot of different factors that play into it. But any of the ones that you can do that will make you feel more safe, the easier a time you're going to have with communing, be that having, you know, depending on what it is that you are um, having some anxiety over. For me, I don't like the idea of someone being able to walk in on me while I am in this kind of open space. So I like to be closed off into another area, if possible. I can do it in a crowd, I can do it in a coffee shop, but I don't necessarily like to do it as much in those kinds of circumstances. Um, you know, so the interruption factor, because it, it's for me, it's not so much that I think anything bad's going to happen. It's that the jarring, there's a little bit of jarring if I'm interrupted. So another thing could be, you know, do you feel more safe if you cast a protective circle and call the particular being and invite them into your protective circle? Like whatever it is that you need to do in order to feel safer, that's, that's going to be better for you. Another thing that is really important, how physical, uh, physically comfortable or well do you feel? I said, I find it very easy to commune with beings that don't have bodies unless I feel wretched in my body, at which point that suddenly becomes much more difficult. <laughs> um, you know, again, there's how good is the other beings human user interface? How many common frames of reference do you have? So, you know, if it's like you're both talking your fourth language in order to get at this, that can be a, a problem. So 
the big thing here is that I would just invite you to, if you're trying to build a relationship with a particular being, get to know them, do an invocation, and then sit and allow things to rise. And if it doesn't work, try it again some other time and do it numerous different times until you begin to start getting some kind of response or a, a kind of response could be, I don't think this being wants a relationship with me, at which point you might try a different one, but I would just keep getting it a try. Like I said, pendulums can be very helpful because that's something where you can ask because in a lot of ways you're talking to the aspects of yourself that are not the ones that have access to the talking self. Ask, you know, am I, am, is this, uh, am I doing this right? Am I open enough? Is the other being attentive at all? Are they getting, am I getting their attention? You know, is it that they don't want to talk to me? See what those other aspects of self are saying. And then write it down. And my other piece of experience is I find I write most often longhand when I'm doing this kind of thing, even though I've got god awful handwriting. But I do find there's something that happens there where other things often start to emerge as I am writing. And it's like in the process of writing, which is really what's happening then is that that is a translation between stuff that is in that um, other aspects of self making its way down into the middle self so it can be expressed. That's kind of what's happening there. So assignment number two, do the invocation that you had planned and ask the great one to commune with you. And like I said, you know, if you've got like all the other stuff, you have some incense, you have some flowers, you have whatever the heck it is that you think are other parts of that calling card, just set that all up and do it. And if it's a being that you have not already had some, kind of some easy communication with, establish a yes, no with a pendulum and ask if they'll use it. Um, ask what you can do to enhance or deepen or sharpen your communication and then be receptive and write down what you get. So just set up a date with a God and, you know, make the call, see if you get an answer, but, you know, do, do your homework first. So devotional practice is really, again, it's about building and maintaining those relationships and relationships require regular interaction, whatever kind of being they are, you have to, you know, actually have some interaction, have some communication. So for intimate relationships, those that are going to be particularly important to you, I advise that you set up an altar, if you can, with some permanent representations of the beings with whom you are in relationship. Light up a candle and commune regularly, preferably daily, but without beating yourself up if you miss some. But the point is, it should be like a normal part of your life. You know, it should be something that is a normal central relationship. You're making it a primary type of relationship in your life. And then do things that would be nice, just like you would do for a friend or a loved one. And that's basically what a devotional practice is. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about the gods, but really for other spirits, it's pretty similar. So for the ancestors, they tend to be easier to understand and, you know, you can have an ancestor altar. I encourage anyone, uh, you know, to have a place where you have representations of the ancestors that you work with. Some of the nature uh, spirits or other types of spirits, they can require a little bit more of that work to really understand each other. And, you know, like I said, this is some pretty serious cross-cultural dialogue. Sometimes if you get the ones who have been in relationship with humans for a long time, those are a lot easier. When you get some that really have not so much, those can be more difficult, but they can also be really rewarding. But the point there is that sympathy, the establishment of fellow feeling is absolutely key. Sympathy, actually, it again, is Greek, sympathos, it means to feel together. So even if you're not getting clear cognitive content, that's the part that you must have. That's the foundation right there is where you are feeling together. So I hope that this is helpful and I encourage you to go do those two bits of practice and I will see you later on in the next module.